My name is Duncan Ruggle. The night in question began when I sat down at my little desk in my little room at about six o'clock and called my good friend Stoney. Hey man, it's Duncan. Very cheerful was I. He was surprised to hear from me, all right. I tried to put his mind at ease, put all the usual pleasantries out there, and just when it started to sound like he wasn't afraid of me, I gave him the pitch. I told him about the opportunity. One night only, this very night. An unexpected chance never to be repeated. The Sigaletti House. The Sigaletti House. How many times had we talked about going to the Sigaletti House at night, at night? And now, now, there were a set of circumstances I didn't want to explain just yet. I had not only been given access, but I was going in with a professional, certified ghost hunter. When I think about how Stoney's imagination must have lit up at the sound of that, and when I think about his voice as it sounded over the phone, like a little kid forgetting all his troubles because Christmas had come two months early, I feel bad for him. I do. I feel sad for him. But only for a second. He wasn't sure about going. He wanted a lot of details, but I was dedicated to teasing them out. I played the nostalgia card. I played the fear of missing out card. How could the most devoted student of the paranormal that Seven Bells had ever seen, Stoney Russell, turn this chance down? All he had to do was meet me at the house in a few hours, and all his curiosities would be satisfied. Twenty-six years of living ten miles from the Sigaletti house, and now he had a ghost hunter. How many people ever got to even meet one? And everything paid for. No trespassing worries, even. It was all legal. Sort of. I just about had him, just about, when he got real quiet. And then he said, hey man, I don't know really what you heard about what went down with me and the police, but there's people who think I wasn't straight with them. The cops kind of put words in my mouth. It was really bad. And I said, no, 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 not at all water under the bridge. At no time, I assured him, had I ever thought he had anything to do with Misty's disappearance. Yes, he had been one of the last people to ever speak to her. Yes, there had been conflicting statements. But Stoney, Stoney, no, no, no. It's all fine. It's all good. The only reason I hadn't called him sooner to hang out like we used to was because, uh, well, with everything that happened, I hadn't felt much like talking to anyone. What a horrible clown show it had all been. And my sister, gone. But now is the time to set all that aside, because we, hey, we were going, him and me, to the Sigaletti house. Who would believe it? He wasn't really going to even think about not going, right? And he had to admit, it sounded very cool. Sweat was pouring down my face as I hung up the phone. I called to this guy Orson back and confirmed it was all on. I was committed and ready to do what he wanted me to do. 8.30 to half past midnight, just like we discussed on email. He'd found out there was good Verizon coverage in the Sigaletti house. And yes, I was definitely on Verizon. The woman Orson had told me about, his girlfriend, had already sent me some paperwork. I'd gone to Staples the day before and printed it out. It looked convincing enough to keep me from getting picked up for trespassing, but Orson was willing to pay for any fine. He would call me ten minutes before the live stream started to make sure I was there and my signal was good, and after that he'd call me back and I'd be on the stream. I did ask him what happened to the first guy, the first guy who'd agreed to do what I had just agreed to do, and Orson told me that he'd actually gotten scared just the day before. He'd driven past the house, and he'd gotten a bad vibe, bowed out, so it had fallen into my lap. Thank you, Stoney. Because you see, it was Stoney, the town's local expert on all things spooky, who first recommended I listen to Orson's show, back when Stoney and I hung out quite a bit, actually. And two years later, bam, the upcoming Sigaletti House episode was announced. Stoney was not one of life's great participators, so he did not apply. I, however, saw my chance. 
Seven Bells is a hurting town. Of course I don't want to live here, but those are the breaks. The walk from my room to the Sigaletti house gives you the very best route to see all the worst of what's here. Normally you wouldn't go through the slabs to get down to Pound Street, but I had time. Even after the time it took to get my stuff into my backpack and wrapped up in a clever way. The slabs used to be where the old medium security prison was until the 60s when they tore it down. But they left the cement foundations for almost everything, never cleared all that out. So it's been cement and weeds and litter for a whole mile ever since. Stoney and I used to play cap guns there. You'll see drug needles there in the weeds if you look, and graffiti is everywhere. As I walked through the dark, I saw a new piece. Someone had painted, North Side Whores Should Rot, on a slab in big purple letters. At least the grass was still kind of pretty at night. I liked the way the street lights hit it. After the slabs, you're in Thomas Jefferson Village. I walked past Mike's Dreamland Cafe, which is just a convenience store and sub shop where we used to go after school sometimes for potato chips and Snapple, all gated up at night. Thomas Jefferson Village is a good place to see abandoned houses. Lots of people who used to work for the freezer factory lived there. I saw no one as I drifted through. It was 7.15, and it was cold. After the village is Cloverlock and at the Sigaletti House. 35 Pound Street. The house on its left is abandoned and half covered in ivy. The house on its right, well, it isn't even there anymore. It's a vacant lot with a big dirt mound in the middle of it that gets smaller every year. Whoever was going to build there gave up, I guess. The windows of the Sigaletti house are almost all boarded. The front porch is all busted up. The lacrosse boys, a gang I think broke up or moved out to Dundalk years ago, left their mark beneath the front upper window on the right, a curvy moon with a wavy line running through. As Orson explained to his viewers when his live stream began, the Sigaletti house is not one of the more famous spooky places. From 1982 to 1989, it was owned by Sibelius and Sonolia Sigaletti, brother and sister. They were in their 30s at the time. Artists. He did experimental portraits, and she did more abstract art. They both had shows around the East while they were alive, but they were real reclusive. Never let themselves be photographed. The rumors said they were both extremely promiscuous, and things eventually turned darker. There were reports of them throwing sex parties inside the house where the guests dressed up in bizarre costumes and stayed for days. There was a lot of drug use. But it was all kept mostly quiet because it all took place inside the art world. That was who made up Sibelius and Sonolia's guest list. People from the city. Then one night, a fancy young Danish art broker named Per Landsassen never returned from the house after one of these parties and the stories really got out. The police investigation didn't really come to anything. And only about six months after that, Sibelius and Sinolia's bodies were found on a mattress on the floor inside one of the upstairs bedrooms. They were naked together. They both had a ton of heroin in their system. And there was evidence an incestuous relationship had been going on for a long time. Sibelius's most famous painting, The Night is Cold and You Must Be Tired, lay at Sinolia's feet, scarred in one corner by her long, jagged toenails. Good luck affording any of the Sigaletti siblings' works today. It goes right to she-she private collectors. Museums won't touch it because of everything that happened. Baltimore County owns the house. Adding to the intrigue tonight, Orson said into his podcasting mic at about half past eight, is that there have been a few disappearances in Seven Bells recently. Highly unusual for a very small town. Yeah, this was true. I probably shouldn't have been out in the slabs. I climbed up onto the porch very carefully. The steps were rotted. I wanted to move kind of fast because the house was in plain view of a couple of addresses across the street. The door had, in fact been opened for me. 
that it wasn't a key that had done it. The lock had simply been busted by Orson's girlfriend. Nothing legal about that. Into the Sigaletti house I went for the first time in my life. Bronwyn, welcome back to the show. It's been a while. Apologies. I've been real busy with my book. How's that going? Not too bad. I just, uh, I've got a lot of information to sort through. I'm sure you get it. But, uh, I was listening, and it occurred to me suddenly when you mentioned Pear Lansassen that we should talk about the Green Man Theory. Yes, the Green Man Theory being the, the tie that a lot of people believe proved the Sigaletti's guilt in his murder in the late 80s. Do you want to take us through that? I didn't know the Sigalettis were ever on your radar. Uh, well, they weren't for long. But I did do a deep dive into them back when... Uh, what was the name of that terrible TV movie? The one with the guy from Dawson's Creek. Correct. That movie was just barely based on the true story. Correct. But yeah, when the police searched one of the bedrooms up on the top floor, they found a sheet with green paint all over it. Which wasn't especially strange since they were painters, but uh, what the police seemed to miss was that when the sheet was laid out fully flat, and this was never noticed until other people saw the crime scene photos years later, the paint patterns really did seem to match up with how the, um, the contours of a human body would print on them, would imprint on them, arms, legs, everything. And what had happened was, at about four in the morning on the night Pear Lansassen disappeared, someone from the area called in about a man running down the road. I think it's, uh, Pelbrook Road? Peldrake Road? Something, uh... Pine Avenue. Yes. Sorry, it's been a while. They said they saw a man with green paint all over him running down that road, which is maybe... Mile yes, so my only problem with the Green Man Theory was that I had thought that those police photos that got released were, they were in black and white, and there was no mention in the report of the color of the paint they found on the sheet. So the story of this phone call to the police, you see what I'm saying? In and of itself, I don't know where there's a record of that. But what we do have, okay, is this testimony by, um, I have the name right here, actually. Just give me a minute. Even before I closed the door behind me, I coughed on that stale, dry air, not quite like anything else I'd ever drawn into my lungs. It wasn't much warmer inside than out. I fumbled around in my backpack and came up with my flashlight. My life for the next four hours would be only what I'd see by its glow, and I knew right away I'd overestimated its capabilities. There was nothing left in the house, of course, no furniture. Lots of loose boards and bricks were still scattered all over the floor, lots of gouges in the walls. They'd all been painted different colors back in the day, dark blue, dark red, dark green, every room different. All the colors were dull and washed out now. Beyond the living room was a big kitchen. The old linoleum floor was missing a perfect giant circle of material. Neatly cut, it looked like. Maybe that's what they do when they need evidence or something? I don't know. Do they cut a sample of the floor and take it with them, the police? Is that what that was? Maybe. There was a closed door in the hallway, and I didn't want to open it. I really didn't but I forced myself to. Used to be a bedroom, I suppose. One of the few windows in the house that wasn't boarded up was in there. I checked out the view. It looked out on the big backyard. If you were to walk across that yard and into the trees and just keep going for about ten minutes on foot, you'd wind up in the field where someone thought they'd found Pear Land Assassin's headless body in 1989. But it was just a drifter's. Thirty-four years ago, that was. I stashed my backpack inside the closet. It was getting real heavy. And I shoved my copy of Red Mars into my jeans pocket for later. 
that it was time to explore upstairs. I stopped for a full minute on one of the top steps when it creaked so loud I thought the whole staircase was going to collapse. There were two more bedrooms and another bathroom up there. I didn't stay long. That second floor was too far away from where I felt even kind of safe. I considered the basement next, just off the kitchen. When I opened the door to go down there, I thought I heard rats running around. I really hate rats. Sometimes you'll see them in the slabs. Now, I closed the door again. The cold sunk into me in a way it hadn't outside. Outside, it was at least a clean, natural cold. I called Orson's number right on time at 8.40, and I was on the air, as they say. We usually get about a couple thousand live streamers, he told me. Very exciting. After the preliminary introductions, I started the video share right through my phone camera. There was a tech glitch at first, but then he said, Yes, yes, we can see. It's on everyone's screen now. So I took everyone on a partial tour. I wasn't expected to say much of anything, which was good. People typed comments into the chat. Orson, oblivious to my plan, gave everyone the history of the house. The video dropped sometimes, but the first check-in was only ten minutes long. Then I hung up. Not a bad way to make five hundred bucks. I opened my book. Tried to get comfortable and waited for Stony. Owl Creek Bridge 71, welcome. Hi, Orson. Uh, do you know about that painting, The Night is Cold and You Must Be Tired? Uh, sure. Yeah, well, I've been trying for years to get people to believe I actually put a bid on it when it got sold back in the 90s. Really? Yeah, I was, uh, I was doing really well in real estate back then, so I gave it a shot. It was very, uh, I- interesting process, to say the least. And did you get to see the painting, or did you, uh, uh well, did you value your sanity too much? Well, the way it worked was you had to buy your way into the auction itself at a certain level. I seem to recall it was something like $5,000, something outrageous. Ouch. And to actually see the painting in person, you had to fly out somewhere. So I never got to see it. And the bid I submitted was about a fifth of what the painting actually went for. Was this like in a catalog with other things? Yeah, a lot of abstract pieces, but it was... Some auction house in Montreal, so you had to deal with the item through a broker. It was all by phone. Hard to believe a reputable place would even run a photo of that in their catalog. Well, let me tell you something about art buyers. You know, if it's valuable, <laughs> they'll, uh, they'll forgive being offended or freaked out. Yeah, just looking at that thing online is more than enough for me. I think it's probably hanging on some dictator's wall now, like Vladimir Putin or somebody. I didn't think I'd want to have sex for the rest of my life after seeing it. Ha! Well... The knock came at quarter past nine, way too soon. At first I didn't know what to do, but I remained calm. When the knock came again, I got to my feet and opened the front door. A cop was out there, young guy. Asked me if I was aware this was private property. He must have seen the light at just the right moment. I was ready. I already had the papers in my hand and I explained everything. Maybe too well, too much. They're doing a a photography exhibit at the State Archives. I said, history of the county. Where's your camera? He asked. And I held the sucker up, a Canon EOS Rebel. I even opened the door further and gestured toward the tripod in the corner of the room, where I'd laid some things out on a blanket, too. Photography things. Gave him my ID. Said that, yes, the name on the top sheet was a good contact to call and confirm everything. It was a rough two minutes, but two minutes was all it was. The cop didn't seem very interested in me. There were only a couple more questions. He told me to keep the papers and 
keep my ID handy in case I was visited again. There were foot patrols in the area that night. Because of the disappearances, I said. He told me he couldn't make any particular comment about that. And then he stepped off the porch and went on his way, without even wanting to come in and look around. The Seven Bells Police. There were always more troubling matters to pursue. I called Stoney. He would be on his way, walking from the trailer park on the west side. He asked about the ghost hunter. He had to go out for a bit, I said. He has this van full of stuff and he wanted to get some kind of reading all around the yard. Weird electronic stuff like I've never seen. I knew that would excite Stoney, whose place was full of old library books about ESP and reincarnation and the fourth dimension and ghosts. I still had time to prepare for him. I went back into the first floor bedroom and into the closet, pulled my backpack out. Big thing it is. Bought for my overnight hikes in the Cornus Trail. I took out the duct tape and the rope and the crowbar and the cleaver I had stolen from the diner where I work, and I brought them all out into the living room. Stuck them all under the blanket on the floor where I could get to them quickly. I got kind of extra curious and bold about the house, my surroundings, the evidence of people coming in and going out again over the years, the homeless staying one night and moving on or maybe squatting there for months, the burn marks, the meaningless pencil traces on the walls, the gouges everywhere from boredom or anger. An old empty bag of Doritos pinned under a broken board. Two empty but unbroken bottles of beer on the bathroom floor near where the toilet used to be. Just a hole there now. I played the beam of the flashlight over the nooks and corners. I went upstairs again, partially to make myself less afraid of it. Fatso invite me to the prom, one bit of graffiti read. That was low on the south wall in what was probably the master bedroom, where Sibelius and Sinolia must have done a lot of their strange things, with their guests, or just by themselves, the two of them. Probably the room where they had been found together, dead. Then I spotted something that didn't make much sense. A weird stain on the floor in the hallway. I'd already passed it twice without noticing. I needed to start being more observant. The stain must have been eight inches across. Sticky looking. The beam of the flashlight, which was getting really weak, altered its original color. Soon I was going to have to dig a fresh set of batteries out of my backpack. I didn't want to touch the stain. The thought of it sickened me. But I really wanted to know if it felt how it looked, which was still a little slick so I did touch it. It was almost completely dry. Almost. It felt like if you were to touch the sticky side of a piece of scotch tape. Only when I looked at my fingertip real close did I see that there was a tiny bit of red tint to the black smudge left on my skin. I almost retched as I wiped it on my jeans. I grew up in Seven Bells. It's a hole. Very happy to have gotten out of there when I went off to college. But we talk about the house all the time in the neighborhood because the rumor was they got these indecency complaints. So as kids, our imaginations went crazy with that. And then there was a a fire. I don't think you talked about the freaky fire. And then uh, one night, must have been, oh, 1987, we were messing around, we were drinking a little, I was maybe 14, and it got to be, come on, let's let's go check it out. And the next thing I knew, there were four of us on the property, the rear part of the yard. It was night, 11 at night. The basement of the Sigaletti house smelled like modeling clay. Twelve steps down into the dark. The railing had been snapped in half at some point, so the last part of the journey was a bit treacherous. I forget how it was me 
who got picked to sneak up to the house, but I did. And I remember kneeling down and looking through the basement window, and I couldn't believe it. Right there inside. Uh... Here, finally, was a piece of furniture. A ripped blue sofa, right in the middle of the floor. The cushions missing. In one corner of the big open space was a pile of boards and bricks that came up all the way to my waist. That debris suggested there had once been a separate room down here, gutted long ago. Here now in front of me was something else strange. The basement had two windows no bigger than placemats set into the back wall, both so grimy that the glass kicked the flashlight beam right back to me. The window to my left was open, slid along its cheap metal track about five inches. Anyone could get inside the house very easily. It didn't take Orson's girlfriend to hack the lock on the front door. Pushed up against the wall beneath the window as a means of support as one climbed in or climbed out was an overturned plastic crate with the name of a pet food company on the side. If I looked down, there was this shriveled old man lying on a table, and he was naked. Some woman was drawing on him. It wasn't painting. It wasn't with a brush. She was just uh, drawing on his stomach. He was clamped down, though. There were these clamps. Very sure this guy did not want to be there. I was watching this for a while because the woman was, you know, I was a kid. I was kind of hypnotized. Uh, I thought maybe she was going to take her clothes off, you know. And then I, I heard something behind me and I turned. And there was this man standing in the yard looking at me. And I was so scared I started running. I just took off but I was going the wrong way, away from my friends. They had to come find me. Do you think it was Sibelius standing there? I think it was. The second knock at the door that night came at 11.15. I knew who it was this time, though, and I opened the door kind of smiling. Stony is a little guy, a little pudgy, always wearing some kind of pop culture t-shirt stuff I don't even get, usually. This time it was Wolverine. He was trying to grow a beard again. He was clearly nervous when we shook hands, and not just because of the house and the darkness and the fact that I alone controlled the light. So as not to make it any worse, I immediately agreed with him that, yeah, it was scary in here. And before he could even ask where the paranormal guy was, I gave him my story, which was that He had been bothered so much by some kind of audio thing he'd picked up just outside the back door that he'd driven back to Hampton for a half hour to get some more equipment. He seemed really freaked out, I told Stoney, who just blinked a few times in wonder and said, Really? EVP? Was it EVP? EVP, that sounds right, I replied. Shaking Stoney's hand had nearly made me sick again. I am proud of myself for making that sacrifice. I took him around a bit. We went up the stairs. What was this guy like? Stoney wanted to know. Good reputation, I said. I checked him out online. And Stoney said, Yeah, but how did you find him? That was an easy one. Other way around, I said. You and I are going to be on that Orson guy show about an hour from now. And I gave my old friend an impressive number of true details about the situation we found ourselves in. I'd put an old newspaper I'd found over the blood stain in the hallway and my backpack over that, so Stoney never saw it as we moved from room to room. He was right. Our footsteps really did sound like we were below the earth, not above it. He took it all in like a poor kid on a school field trip to a fancy museum. The guys got some equipment in the basement, I told him before he could ask the obvious question. But there was no need to worry. Stoney's brain never moved that fast. He was too busy gawking at the dangerously crooked ceiling fan above him, 
which seemed to be hanging only by a single screw. It was really sinking into Stoney that he and I were in the house all alone. A lot scarier with two people instead of three, he said nervously. Nah, I assured him. We'll be all right. He put a hand up to the window in the master bedroom and felt the cold air that seeped through a tiny crack between the glass and the wooden plank affixed outside to cover the cutout. He walked to the spot where a bed had once been. You could still see the traces of its shape and the way the color of the planks hadn't faded quite as much. He stared down at them, running the whole history through his mind. There was very little Stoney didn't know about the Sigaletti house. In the foul dark, I was looking at a man who had crossed off a major part of his bucket list. What a favor I had done for him on this night. Downstairs, a knock at the front door again. Stoney, assuming it was the paranormal investigator, looked relieved not to be alone with me anymore. I hesitated, my thoughts racing, but I understood I had no choice but to answer it. The knocking was soft, not urgent at all, but it kept coming. Whoever was out there was not going to go away. We went back down the stairs. Just as we got to the bottom step, we saw the front door pushed inward a little. They finally couldn't wait. It was a man in his 60s, or even 70s, maybe. Real skinny, big coat, button-up shirt tucked into his slacks, the way old men do, even when they're just walking down their driveway to get their mail. Zachary, his name was. Professor at McDaniel. He didn't care when I told him I had papers to let me in the house. Didn't care at all. He'd been listening to Orson's live stream, so he knew I was out here. I told him me and Stoney were probably about to leave. But he knew I had another check-in with the show coming up. I wish you would skip it, he said. He'd driven out there just to tell us that. It was the worst possible night to be out here in the house. Professor Zachary explained to us. There were alignments all around us, he said. Alignments that were very deep and strange. Sometimes they happen, he said. Mostly they don't. This was just not a night anyone wanted to be here. Poor Stoney. I thought he looked terrified. Like the anniversary of them dying or something? He asked this man. But it wasn't as simple as that, apparently. The professor turned his head back and forth between us. It was weird how he was giving us both the exact, precise, same amount of eye contact, like he was programmed. The professor looked real uncomfortable like he was trying consciously to not look at any part of the room, take in no detail of the house he didn't absolutely have to. I kept the flashlight pointed at his feet, so his head was sort of fuzzy. Like, what could happen to us if we hung around? Stoney asked him. That made the old professor think on it for a bit. He said we might see things we otherwise wouldn't, and maybe that was all. Our behavior might become erratic, maybe. But if I'm right, he said, there can be long-term things. I assured him we'd probably just go. I could tell he wanted to get out of there now. I did ask him, very politely, what his credentials were to claim such a dramatic thing about the house. And how is this for a quinky dink? He and some scholar friends had been the last private owners of the place in 2002. I realized in that moment that the deed papers, which had been copied and partially forged from the public records so I wouldn't get busted for trespassing, actually had his name on them. I didn't feel the need to reveal that bit. The last thing he told us was that if we stayed, no one could help us. And then he left. No fuss. Turned around, opened the door, 
went back out onto the porch. He had a little tan Honda at the curb. Didn't look back at the house, not for a second. Started the car, drove away down the silent street. Not a single other house on the block had a light on. I looked at my watch. Time was slipping away. Stoney wanted to go too, now. He didn't feel right about this anymore. I told him, sure. I mean, it would be interesting to wait for the paranormal guy to come back, but I didn't want to do any of this without Stoney, of course not. I just had to gather up my stuff, all my stuff on the floor. But that's the ghost hunter's camera stuff, isn't it? Stoney pointed out helpfully. You know, when you have a design, you need to cover every eventuality. And something as simple as not having a sufficient answer at just the wrong moment can force your hand too soon, unless you can think on your feet. But as my dear father would tell you, that's never really been my strong point. Did you hear that? I asked Stoney. Hear what? He said. From the basement, I said. I handed him the flashlight and walked past him. I bent down and rummaged around under the blanket on the floor, making sure my back was completely blocking his view. I'm going down the stairs, I said to Stoney. I just need you to point the light as I go. Why'd you even bring that? Stoney asked, nodding at the crowbar I had dug out. He shone the flashlight directly into my face, and I put a hand out gently to push the tip down a few inches. Like you said, I replied, it's scary in here. He followed me down the hall and into the kitchen. He stumbled once on a loose board, righted himself, shook the flashlight to try to strengthen its beam, and asked what the sound had been because he hadn't heard anything. I hummed some music for a few seconds to calm him down. Remember that? I said to him. From that movie Phantasm? Remember when we rented that? Like a week before Errol's closed for good? I was grinning real wide. I'm going home, Stoney said and he began to turn. You're going to die first, I told him, and swung the crowbar. Orson had begun to show his audience House of Usher with Vincent Price at 10.30, leaving his viewers to comment on it throughout in a scrolling text window on the right side of the screen, which was soon filled with jokes, silly commentary, the shout-outs between guild members who knew each other, the first-timers dropping in, the veterans swapping inside gags and emojis. I dialed back into the stream just before my final check-in of the night, when in the movie, the House of Usher imploded and collapsed in a fiery red cloud of melancholy and madness. On my phone, I watched steam rise from the fetid ground, Good luck getting your security deposit back, typed Strawberry Girl Zero. More room for condos, typed Slow Joe Buck. Think of all the people who had to come to the rubble afterward, though. Someone calling themselves Talisman added in lowercase text, disregarding punctuation and capitalization. Carrying all that away in carts and wheelbarrows day after day to which others replied with multiple question marks and tiny round digital faces with puzzled expressions. Way to make the story even more depressing, typed someone named Tardis Dealer, adding a little blue cloud to each side of their typo-ridden sentence. I bet children played in the vacant lot and then talked about it when they were old. Talisman went on among the conversational fuss that had already left him or her behind. Then a chatbot informed all that Talisman had left the room. It was more video Orson wanted for the final segment, and I gave it to him. I stayed out of the basement once again and gave the audience just the main floor and the top floor, 
holding my phone camera out ahead of me with one hand, illuminating the steps ahead with the flashlight held in the other. Just a few more minutes, that was all that was required of me. I was asked a couple of times if I had seen anything or heard anything strange, and I said, no, not really. But I decided there was no harm in telling Orson about the professor's visit, and he ate that up, every detail. And about every detail, I was honest and accurate. Orson thought I was lying, probably, being a showman. But how could I not sound anything but convincing to his streaming audience? I showed them all the bedrooms yet again, and the bathroom, and the hallway, mostly for the benefit of those who had joined the stream late, but also to provide one last chill to the viewers who had stayed all the way through. Stop for a second, stop for a second. Orson's voice squeaked through my tiny phone speaker at one point. There had been a sudden flurry of activity in the chat. A number of people seemed to want me to turn and point the camera at the north end of the hallway. Many viewers claimed to have seen something. I missed it, Orson said. Is anyone watching recording this? Do you want to help us out here? A few people were. I was asked to remain in place while... Orson got on a separate screen tab and rolled back the video. There was awkward silence as the screen commentary continued to flow. Oh, yeah, I heard him finally say. Duncan, did you not see that giant bird when you turned your body away from that window? I moved back down the hallway toward the window. One wavy crack had split the glass long ago on an almost perfect diagonal. There's a huge bird, Orson was saying as he watched the video. It flew past. There's just a couple of frames, but wait, is that a bird or something else? Others urgently chimed in, but I had no more time for their nonsense. Until dawn, if they wanted to, they could debate whether it was a bird or the face of a woman. A young woman peering in as if she were floating outside. Frame by frame they could forensically go. That wasn't why I was there. In the basement, Stoney was where I had laboriously dragged him, then left him, bound crudely to the sofa as best as I could manage. It had taken all the duct tape left on the roll. There had barely been any left to cover his mouth. The chloroform had mostly worn off, but he was still too groggy to speak. That's some strange stuff, chloroform. It had taken several minutes to put Stoney down. He blinked away the light shining in his eyes and seemed to recognize me, at least. I was worried that hitting him in the stomach with a crowbar Just that one swing had done so much damage, he might not wake up. You can't assume it's going to be like in the movies. I went to the window and dragged the plastic crate across the dust over to the sofa, and I sat down on it, and I looked into Stoney's face. It wasn't that I was going to hurt him because I thought he had killed Misty. That had never seriously entered my mind, because Stoney was weak. Stoney was incapable of actual violence. I was going to hurt him because of the way he had hounded Misty for years, like a lovesick puppy, from her early troubles all the way into her time of complete desperation, when she would finally turn to anyone to help her, because I wouldn't any longer. As soon as he got his chance, He had catered to her sickness and her addictions and made them even worse, thinking that was love. But when she disappeared, he could think only of himself and saving his own miserable, dope-dealing skin. So he had lied and made what the police were trying to do, which was find my sister, that much harder. I told Stoney I would split the responsibility for Misty's vanishing three ways. 
one-third to the heartlessness of my mother and father, one-third to me, one-third to him. Mom and dad had their due coming, but not till the next night, when I would have to take the bus out to Catonsville, on the slim chance I hadn't been arrested by then. I had the cleaver in my hand now, and because I was not an experienced or skilled torturer, I just moved the tip of it toward Stoney's face, and when he closed his eyes, I rested the edge of the blade on his right eyelid, and I just let it be there, pushing in just a little, not even drawing blood, just so he would feel the steel against his skin. I told him what I intended to do with his hands. I had decided there was some kind of symbolism in the hands thing, but I was having such difficulty concentrating, I, I forgot to tell him what it was. I expected him to tremble and shake and make noises, but he had become very docile, very calm. I didn't like that. It wasn't like Stoney to not complain. I heard a rapping on the front door upstairs one more time. My own fault, really. I had lingered too long. We make our own problems, and we create our own solutions. I knew this was not the police or any rational adult because of its petty urgency and because it stopped right away. Still, though, I needed to know. I turned away from Stoney, and I climbed the stairs. I looked back at him just to see how small he looked, bound and gagged and helpless. I tucked the cleaver into the waistband of my jeans for my return to the basement. I opened the door into the kitchen, and I crept out into the hallway. Whoever had been out there was likely already long gone. Kids, probably. The possibility even existed that someone else local had been watching the stream and wanted to have a bit of fun, scaring me. Nevertheless, I walked to the door and opened it, just a crack. It had gotten real windy outside. A balloon was sailing down Pound Street, one of those big mylar things, heart-shaped. Just when it seemed like it was headed up into the sky, it got knocked down again by a gust. I went out onto the porch no longer really caring who knew I was there. I liked the feel of the wind on my face. Not until that moment did I realize how poisoned the air inside of the Sicoletti house was. I felt like someone emerging from months on a submarine. Just another half hour or so and I could go to sleep. Another suggestion of movement caught my eye then. A woman was out there, far away, in a long dress, she was walking toward the far end of the street, moving out of one pool of lamplight and into another, where the pavement curved and worked up toward Norris Road. She stopped and turned back toward the house. Her face was an undefined blot. Someone was waiting for her farther up. Everything above the waist was in the dark, but I am sure it was a man. She joined him. They dissolved into the dark together. Back inside, I went. When I got to the top of the basement stairs, I shone the flashlight downwards at the filthy sofa. Stony was gone. I clambered down the stairs recklessly, not being careful at all with my balance. The tape that had bound Stony to the sofa had been cut in one long, neat path. High above me somewhere, so far away it might have come from a different house altogether. I heard Stoney give a friendly shout. He invited me to come back up. He sounded very different. There was a confidence in his voice that had never been there before. I decided to cloak myself right away. I shut off the flashlight. That meant I had to reach out and feel the darkness as I went. My fingers always grasping for the next touch to guide me. I bent over and felt for the steps to judge where the first one's center point was. I began to climb delicately, 
and the outline of the door above me eventually swam into view. Some nice woman let me out, Stoney called out to me from high above. Now he sounded closer, but maybe not ground floor close. Maybe he, too, was navigating a flight of stairs with as much delicacy as he could muster, and in fear of stumbling and falling, for he had no light source. She's gone now, Stoney said. It's just you and me. I waited on the top step for any sound of movement, but he was being clever. I moved back through the door I'd left open. I looked down the hallway leading from the kitchen, but everything was lost in a colorless, swampy void. Stoney said he had something to show me. All I had to do was come part of the way upstairs. But I thought maybe his voice wasn't even coming from up there anymore. So I waited. My watch ticked the seconds. There was a thump nearby, followed by another and another, and rotting wood buckled and cracked. I crouched because I thought Stoney was running down the stairs, but no. What I had heard was that he'd thrown something down them. Here then, he called. Not my first time here, Dunk. Surprised? That was when I knew it was endgame, just from the tone in his voice. I assumed he had the crowbar, but I thought the cleaver should do, and if I had to, I would beat him to death with the flashlight. I entered the hallway. From there, I had an excellent visual angle on the bottom of the staircase. I finally turned the flashlight back on and poked the beam in that direction. Whatever he had thrown had gone all the way to the bottom. A bunch of rags, looked like at first. I moved closer. Misty had not decomposed enough inside her clothes to become unrecognizable. Just skinny and dark gray all over, like a mummy. Like someone had painted her wasted body with stucco. Just her top half, actually. That was all there was. Her mouth had shriveled up more than any other part of her, and she seemed to be snarling at me. I've been keeping everyone in the attic, Stoney told me from the top of the stairs. Who was that woman? She said, now go kill each other. You ready to die, Dunk? Stoney, the Stoney, none of us, really knew was coming down. A hatchet was in his right hand, one of three he had scrolled away in the attic. And so, like the great plastic warhammer warriors we used to play with in his grandmother's basement, we met in combat, he and I, while my sister stared off into one corner of the Sigaletti house with eyes shriveled to little dead reasons. They came to me sometime before dawn, after I'd been sitting with my back against the bathroom door upstairs with my knees drawn up to my chest for some time. Hours. Maybe I even slept, I don't know. I don't remember sleeping, but it's possible I did. A tiny fire glow appeared at the far end of the hall, unexpected and warm and inviting, like the North Star appearing from behind a cloud to a lonely traveler. A man and a woman emerged from the master bedroom. She held a small brass tray with a little candle sitting on it. I forget what you call those little candles. She was barefoot, wearing the same dress she'd been wearing out on Pound Street. She did not seem concerned as she moved that she might cut her foot on a piece of broken glass or a protruding nail or slip in blood. I found the strength to stand. You're so strong, she said to me when the two of them had drawn close. We were right to wait for you. Would you like to be with us? Lie down with us. Smiling seemed an easy thing for her, but not for the man. He said nothing, expressed nothing. 
All I had to do was pinch the flame of the candle out, wet the tips of my fingers, and pinch it out. And if I didn't want to do it now, I could come back. It didn't matter when, because they lived there, and I would always be welcome. There was even a glass of water on the tray, because they knew I was likely parched. I didn't need to wait. It had been a long, long time since someone had asked for my company. So imagining sunny mornings with my new friends out on the front porch, drinking orange juice at a linen-covered table and learning about art, I set out with joy towards the North Star.